Hello, welcome back to The Language Code. My name's Anna. Now my two weeks of planning stretched out a little, but I'm ready now to stick my teeth into morphology and I hope that you're ready to come along for the ride. So, morphology. You may remember that morphology is one of the subsystems of language. So here's a chart of the subsystems. Perhaps you've noticed that my chart looks a little bit different to the previous series on grammar. And this is because I have decided to use a model that includes pragmatics here. Uh, I'm very keen to branch off into pragmatics another time, but right now I'm here to talk all about morphology. So here we go. Morphology. Morphology is the study of how a word is formed, how it's put together. By breaking words down into their meaningful parts, we can see how they piece together to make greater meaning. So the smallest meaningful part of a word is called the morpheme. There it is there, the smallest meaningful part of a word. And this is not to be confused with a syllable. So I've got here morpheme equals syllable, question mark. And I can guarantee that in fact, a morpheme does not equal a syllable. Okay, a syllable, I've said it very small right down the bottom here because it's not really essential to what we're learning today. But just for extra information, um, a syllable is a single beat of sound that usually comprises of a vowel nucleus. Uh, it's usually talked about in music, a syllable is just one beat of sound, okay? And of course, language is, in a way, a bit of music as well. So of course, it's gonna come up in language too. Uh, and it's not to be confused with a morpheme. A morpheme can be more than one beat of sound as long as it's the smallest meaningful part of a word. So I think that's what we want to really get out of understanding today, just what we fully understand what a morpheme is and how it's significantly different to a syllable, which is where most of us get confused. All right, so let's have a look at four words that I've got here. And these words are pumpkin, vowed, sunglasses, and unmask. And underneath each word I've written S for syllable and M for morphine. So I'm gonna pull out my red pen here and uh, we're gonna figure out uh, how many syllables and how many morphemes are in each word. Now it might be just a little point of note here that sometimes because history goes a long way back and we don't always know the original meanings of words, sometimes we're not fully aware of how many morphemes are in a word unless we really do um, scrape into that etymology and, and sort of uncover it. So the way we figure out morphemes now if we don't know is we do the smallest meaningful part of the word that we currently know or understand but we might actually be wrong sometimes we're wrong but if usually we can understand by affixes um, uh, we can sort of figure it out so let's take the first word pumpkin for example now we can figure out that the word pumpkin has two syllables because we can clap it pumpkin there's our syllables two so i'm going to write that there what about morphemes? Does pump and kin, well, they both have meanings, uh, but are they the smallest meaning of the word pumpkin? Well, in this case, I know that the word pumpkin comes from the French pompone, or however it's spoken, I'm not a French speaker, um, but I know that because of my etymological understanding of the word, not because I particularly know French. Um, so this gives me a little bit of insight into its structure. Um, but even so I know that it's only one morphine pumpkin is just a meaning in and of itself it doesn't get broken down any smaller however even if I weren't to know that I would ask the question kin yes that's a word it kind of means my brethren or someone that I'm related to and and pump well obviously you know it means to put air into something or related to air I still don't think that that's got anything to do with pumpkin so perhaps this word pumpkin comes from a different a different source than these two particular words put together. So morphologically, you can see it raises questions, but um, it doesn't have to be broken down into the smallest, uh, it has to be broken down into the smallest meaningful part of the word in relation to what it is. So in this situation, this is only one 
morpheme. Look, I hope that wasn't to um, jibbery, but let's have a look at some other examples to help uh, sort it out. So our second example here is vowed, okay? So if we think of the syllable and what the syllable is, we can just clap it. So let's do that. Vowed. Well, that's clearly just one syllable, okay? We don't say vowed, we say vowed. So it's one syllable. However, uh, we can break this down into different meaningful parts of the word. The first part of it is the main sort of morpheme here. We've got vowel, okay? And that's where our meaning comes from. And then we have this ed here on the end. And this ed tells us meaningfully that it's in the past tense. So it gives us some functional understanding of the word. So in this case, even though the word is only one syllable, it actually has two morphemes. So the opposite to pumpkin above. All right, let's have a look at sunglasses. We'll start off with the syllables. Let's do it. Sunglasses. Okay, yep. That's um, three syllables. We can clap three different sounds from that. So let's write three syllables. Now let's think about how it's put together. Well, sun and glass is a compound noun. Sunglass is the compound noun to from sun, the meaning of the sun, and well, glasses or glasses for where, um, where, where the word comes from, of course, the, the thing that we look out of to help us with our sight. Okay, so that's clearly a compound word. So sun and glass, and of course, es gives us a sense that it's plural. All right, so there we have sunglasses. And in this situation, we have the compound of two lexical sort of words there, sun plus glass. And then we have the ES on the end, which is our functional information um, that it's plural. All right, so let's make that three morphemes. And finally, we have the word unmask, okay? So let's first of all get the syllables. So I'll just pop my pen down and um, so we can do our clap. Unmask. Well, that's two syllables. Very easy there. So let's put two. Okay. And what about the morphemes? Well, we have the main part of the word here, which is mask. That's the stem of the word, the main part. And on the front this time, not on the back, we have a prefix, something that gives us in this situation the opposite information. So instead of to mask someone, we're unmasking them, we're uncovering them. So it gives us the opposite meaning. So therefore, there are two meaningful morphemes in this word. Okay, so that's essentially the way morphemes work. And morphology is really how these morphemes come together, what these morphemes mean, and how they impact on lots of um, things when it comes to understanding uh, our language, okay? By understanding this, we can actually contribute to our own mastery of spelling, uh, which, is, which is a useful thing. Uh, we can also um, control how we put bigger words together and be able to spell those. So if we're teaching spelling, breaking them down into their morphemes is actually a useful way of, of approaching that. So morphology really is an important part of language and how it comes together. Our next video is going to start off uh, by looking at the difference between free morphemes and bound morphemes. And that's where we'll start off our exploration of morphemes and how they work. So until then, it's great to be back. And thanks for watching The Language Code.